in the 14th chapter of the Gospel by John. John's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 26. But the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Book of the Acts, chapter 1, verse 5. John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The message is in the title, The Holy Spirit. We have sought in earlier messages to make clear that the Holy Spirit lays the foundation for all the work of God in the character of Jesus. Makes the character of Jesus the basis of all his work. And we last night were occupied with the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. That great feature and characteristic of the Lord Jesus. Truth. This morning I'm going to think about the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth holiness, the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, he is referred to as such somewhere about 80 times, which in itself is a very impressive thing the Holy Spirit. I am perfectly well aware that this subject of holiness or sanctification can be a very heavy going matter. Can be oppressive. I confess to you that for a long time it was the one subject I never enjoyed looking into or having anything to do with. It can make for difficulties. That is very largely due to the fact that it as a subject has been resolved into various systems of teaching and made respectively the ground of particular cults and movements and even taking on the name of a church, the Holiness Church. And this whole matter has brought many Christians into bondage and into confusion, frustration of life. That is mainly due to holiness or sanctification being focused down upon some particular aspects of human life. When you come to ask people what they mean, you usually find that they refer to certain common sins 
in human nature. And uh, if you are delivered or can be delivered or want to be delivered from those, then that is holiness. I'm not saying that holiness does not mean that. But holiness is a very much bigger, greater thing than any of our systems or our crystallized teachings or our movements or our foci of application. This is not intended to bring anybody either into bondage or into a life of struggle and strain. I think it's just in this very connection that Satan has shown his cleverness. He himself brought about an unholy condition and then he turns upon his own poor victims and brings them under terrible condemnation and accusation and brings about a constellation of complexes so that they are all tied up on this matter of sin and sanctification and holiness. That certainly ought not to be the effect of the matter. It is just the opposite to what is, is intended to be. Now, it's a matter, of course, which goes far beyond the limits one brief half hour but I do want to seek to get this matter into its right perspective for at the outset holiness must be seen in its full setting We're not stopping to argue that this is the supreme characteristic of God We have to see it in its full background. The Holy Spirit is set over against an unholy spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a person. And just as truly there is a personal, unholy spirit. And you will have to see this whole matter of holiness in that light. Satan it is who has brought in an unholy state. Not only an unholy condition, that is true, but I use that word state with a capital S as we speak of the state or the kingdom or the regime, the system, the government, the state. Satan has brought in an unholy condition and an unholy kingdom or state. He has this defiled everything. He has defiled human nature. He has defiled the creation. He has defiled everything. And the proof is in the universality of death. God's verdict upon all that is unclean, that is defiled, that has been touched by Satan. It is therefore impressive and instructive to note that immediately Jesus had been anointed by the Holy Spirit, he entered upon a direct and immediate battle with Satan himself. From the Jordan 
straight to the wilderness to meet and encounter this arch foe of all righteousness. As Jesus went into his baptism, he said to John, Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And in figure and representation, his baptism as a type of his cross, death, burial, and resurrection was the fulfillment of all righteousness. Now then, on that ground, he encounters the embodiment of all unrighteousness. And this is under the anointing that he does it. The spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, takes the righteous one to encounter the universality of unrighteousness as represented by Satan there in the wilderness. I say it's impressive and it is very instructive to note that that was the very first thing after the anointing, after the baptism. Now, the object and the method of Satan is always to make a link with his state, to make a link with his kingdom, thereby making a link with his defilement. Remember that. We repeat it. The object and the method of Satan is always try to bring about some complicity, some touch, some foothold, some link with his own evil, unholy kingdom or state or condition. That is what was happening in that battle. All the time, Satan from one angle and from another, moving round, was trying to involve that righteous one in his unrighteous kingdom. We're not going to argue out those three temptations, but it's perfectly clear at last it comes out if thou wilt worship me. If only you will recognize me, accept me, give me a place. If only thou wilt worship me, all this will I give thee. Only, in other words, I can get you onto my ground. I've spoiled your kingdom. I've spoiled you. I have established myself. I can make that link. Blessed be God, that holy and righteous one saw through it all and said, No, not a hoof. Not one iota. Nothing for Satan. The prince of this world cometh to me and hath nothing in me. That's victory. Absolute victory. Now remember then that what was true in his case is always true. Satan is ever seeking to find some way in which he can link us in with his kingdom, which is his power, by getting us onto his ground. Hence, all those Old Testament prescriptions made by God against contamination, against mixture, thou shalt not now with an ox and an ass together. Nothing wrong with the ass, the ass as such, but Jesus rode upon an ass. And the ass served many a good purpose in the Bible, but they belong to two realms, two kingdoms, and represent two orders of life, and you cannot mix them up, says God. The work of God must not be done on the basis of mixed of two things which belong to two different kingdoms and realms. Thou shalt not wear cotton and wool together in thy garments. They belong to two kingdoms. There's nothing wrong with wool. The God clothed the man his wife 
with the skins of animals, of wool, nothing wrong with the wool in itself. I suppose all the patriarchs wore woolen garments, but here, together, woven together, they belong to two realms, and God is simply saying this, you must not try to bring together things that don't belong to each other. The foreshadowing of this great principle. Remember, when the remnant came back from captivity, the rebuilding of the temple and the walls, the whole thing headed, headed up. The book of Ezra, the whole thing headed up to this, the mixed marriage. And when that was settled, every, the book closes. The book closes. That's the end. It's all right. Now we've got to the point. The mixed marriages between the people of God and other idolatrous nations, these two things must not come together. Be not unequally yoked. God will not have it. See, this is the whole point of holiness. In its right setting, it is providing Satan with what he is always seeking, trying to work toward a link with his own kingdom. Now, this is very thorough going and it is very comprehensive. For instance, let us allow this principle to take us right into the first letter to the Corinthians. Because this is the thing, you know, that explains everything in that book. Here in this first letter to the Corinthians, you first of all begin with the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world. You know all the apostles said about it there? And then listen to a li apostle later. The wisdom that is from beneath is demoniacal. Oh, wisdom of this world. Demoniacal. Well, so the word says. So the word says. And if we want the proof of that, come back to Paul's argument that it was in the wisdom of this world that Christ was crucified. It was thought to be the wise thing to put him to death. What folly, what madness, what devilishness in the wisdom of this world. Yes, and anybody who really touches that knows that it's a realm of death. I don't know, I don't suppose anybody here, maybe one or two, have dipped into philosophy, but if you have, you know that there is no more deadly thing in all the sciences than philosophy. You touch it, you touch death. Wisdom in Corinth. The wisdom of this world. Ah, yes, Satan got a good foothold inside that church, along that line. He got them onto his ground right enough. The next thing, divisions among you. Divisions among you. Remember, and this may be anticipated, the Holy Spirit is essentially the spirit of unity. There are divisions among you. Satan has got them onto his ground. For he is the great divider. Satan never stops until he has divided the last thing. He comes to one, he'll make two of it. Never stops. Divisions among you. They're on his ground. Nothing need be said about the next thing mentioned, fornication. But then you move on to the Lord's table. You hear the apostle saying, you cannot, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Don't mix these things up like this. But it was there in Corinth. It was there. And listen, you've got to read that tenth chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians in this light. In this light. Oh, don't extract 
crack subjects from that chapter about uh, women wearing hats or head coverings and all those difficult things that lift them right out. The eleventh chapter. Lift them out as separate subjects. And if you do, you just get into confusion. Look here. What the apostle was dealing with, with there was the the coming in amongst the Lord's people of the spirit of this world. That's how the world behaves or misbehaves. That's how the world does it. And that world is Satan's world. And if you let this sort of thing in, this sort of thing, study it in this light, all these details, practical matters, if you let these things in, it is not just that uh, you are having to deal with an apostle whom you think had uh, not too uh, much of a liking for women, and so on. You know. No, no. You're up against tremendous things here. It is Satan seeking to get inside and get a foothold, a link between what is holy and what is his, in order that defiling or bringing the world in, touching with his corruption defilement, he may destroy that thing of God. Read it all in that night, for that is where the New Testament puts it. Let lest Satan should get an advantage. See, the soul of the bulwark is raised against this one, this unholy spirit that is in the universe, this corrupting influence and power, this defiling work is raised against that. Church is always to be on its guard against this, these spirits of uncleanness that are everywhere. Why? Because of the power of holiness. It's not just to have a clean condition as something in itself, oh, don't make holiness an end in itself, just to be something in itself. No, it is the power, the mighty power power of holiness. Remember that in the Bible, and it's so clearly and strongly illustrated in the Old Testament, holiness is always militant. It was the priest that led them into battle. It was the sacrifice that was the ground of the warfare. It's the most impressive thing that even the Levites are spoken of as set apart for their warfare. Levites, priests set apart for warfare. Well, they were set apart to offer sacrifices and do all that. No. Holiness is militant. It's a mighty power against one who is militant. Our warfare is with principalities and powers. They're making war. There's no doubt about it. They make war. What is the ground of our hope? Oh, it is not our phraseology, our language, our terminology, or our doctrine. It's our holiness of life. That's the point of attack. Unholiness, unholiness puts God back. God is holy. The Holy Spirit is holy. And unholiness just keeps them back or puts them back. It binds their hand, they can't do anything. It is as though the Lord is bound in the midst of his people and helpless, paralyzed when there is unholiness. I pulled a book out of bookshelf this week, a book that I haven't read for a long time, for many years. As I was turning the pages, I came on this. It's just one simple, fragmentary illustration of what I mean, because it brings us to a very practical point. It's the story of a Christian college that was carried on by prayer and by faith for all its support. 
says this. I'm going to read this to you. I don't often read something out of a book to you here. The college was based on the simplicity of daring faith in God for the provision of needs. As long as the spiritual life of the men was maintained, the necessary funds came in in answer to prayer. If supplies failed to come in or were low with no sign of replenishment, it was recognized that the finger of God was on some failing or unconfessed sin among them. And not until this was put right would supplies come in. <clears throat> Thus, the meeting of the material needs became, as it were, the spiritual barometer. One instance of this may be recorded. Funds were so low that a meeting was held and the students urged to a more complete surrender to God. Still matters did not improve, and it was felt that possibly the men were not devoting sufficient time to prayer. So the curriculum was curtailed, and more time devoted to prayer. But still no supplies. And finally, all funds came to an end. And there was only the garden produce left. Then, late one night, two students came to the tutor and confessed secret drinking. He gave urgent advice to repair to God and confess their sin and plead forgiveness not for the sake of the loaves and fishes, but because of the leaven of hypocrisy. And they did that. Confession was made before the whole college, and united prayer was offered. The next day was set apart for fasting and humiliation and prayer, at the close of which they gathered together with a great heart thankfulness feeling the moral and spiritual atmosphere was cleansed and that God would be able to give an exhibition of his faithfulness. God honored their faith and the very next morning came a check for 50 pounds. Very simple story, but it illustrates what I mean. Whole work of God to be held up. A whole assembly and have its spiritual life injured, limited. The warfare of the saints can be turned into defeat. Oh, what a lot will result if the Lord has to stand back and say, I'm sorry, I can't go on with you. There's this, there's that. There's an Achan, there's an Ananias, and a Sapphira, and he knows. Dear friends, unholiness, you see, in something that was, after all, only a small part of the whole, two men in a whole college, or one man in all its world, or two men in the church at the beginning, a man and his wife in the church at the beginning. Yes, well, well, the majority are all right. The mass are not doing the job, nevertheless. The Holy Spirit focuses right down on that because he is bound to the corporate principle. He is committed to the corporate principle. On the one hand, if one member suffers, all the members suffer. If one member rejoices, all the members rejoice. There is a relatedness which is sacred to the Holy Spirit. And our blessing, our blessing, benefits the whole church. Our sin, our unholiness may cripple the whole church. Solemn word I know. Holiness is militant. It is power of 
triumphant warfare. Holiness is Christly character. Holiness is not formal makeup, something put on. Lord Jesus saw right through that with scribes, Pharisees, rulers, none of that. No makeup spiritually will pass with the Holy Spirit. Holiness is Christly character. More than teaching, more than profession, <clears throat> more than pretense, more than formal procedure on the outward side, it is the very person, the very life, the very character of Christ in the believer and in the church. Very big matter, far bigger than this, but that's enough. The holy spirit, the spirit of holiness, because he is dead, everything else follows. Everything else follows. Now, for your comfort, let me say this in closing. Those men who were gathered in that upper room for those ten days and on that particular day in themselves I don't think were any more holy than they were when one of them denied the Lord Jesus Christ. They had all forsaken him and fled in that way denied him they were all guilty and I don't think that on the day of Pentecost in themselves they were any more holy than they were before but the spirit came upon them what for? to make them holy to make them holy to set up a holiness of life within them you haven't got to struggle to get to a place of holiness trying to make yourself worthy of the Holy Spirit. You have to be where they were before the Lord set upon all that the Lord had spoken of. Obedient to what the Lord has said. That is what they were doing. After he had com given them commandment through the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe that that relates to the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Immediately, the context said, he commanded them that they depart not from Jerusalem. After he had given commandments by the Holy Spirit, they are obeying his command. That is, they are there, open, diligent, committed, earnest, ready, waiting on him. Men, many, many imperfections, but the Holy Spirit saw a way in them, a way in them, and he came and took that way.